Rami Hurry is our guest, and he will be discussing the tumultuous Middle East. Rami is founding director and senior fellow at the Islam Ferris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, and he is a non-resident senior fellow at the Balfour Center at Harvard. He also serves as editor-at-large of the Beirut-based Daily Star newspaper and is a syndicated columnist for Agence Global Syndicate USA and the Daily Star. So let me begin by asking you, what's going on? Is this the beginning of the Third World War? So what's going on, essentially, is we're paying the price, I think, for a rather calamitous century from 1915 to 2015. We've had a, a century of very erratic development in the Arab world. Um, we did pretty well from 1920 till 1980. There was sustained national development all over the region. But since the 1980s and the end of the Cold War in 1990, the well-being of the majority of people in the Arab world has been on a downward slide. And what we're dealing with now is the combination of uh, lousy governance in the Arab world mostly, the uh, terrible consequences of continuous foreign military intervention in our region. And I say foreign because it's not just American, it's Russian, European, Iranian, Israeli, and inter-Arab as well. So you have the Saudis fighting in places, and the uh, Emiratis, and, the, and Hezbollahs in Syria. So there's a lot of foreign troops fighting inside Arab countries. And it's been nonstop for the last 25 or uh, 30 years. And population growth has outstripped economic growth. So that broadly speaking, of the 370 million Arabs today, we probably have around 150 or 200 something, and around half the people in the Arab world are living at, near, or under the poverty line. And if you look at more nuanced analyses of their conditions, there's a huge sense by tens of millions, maybe even a couple of hundred million Arabs, that they don't have a chance to really improve their lives anymore. Unlike the previous five generations since the 1920s, when all the people in the Arab world, even if they were poor, even if they were living in autocratic countries, which they mostly all of them were, they felt that the future is going to be better by education, by working hard, by being creative, by interacting with people. They felt that their world, their world and their children's world was going to be better than theirs. That sense has been pretty much, uh, has pretty much vanished from so many people's lives, which we saw with the Arab uprisings five years ago, which was a phenomenal process across the region. And we saw it with the birth of uh, ISIS uh, as one deviant expression uh, of this. So what's happened is that a century of development has stalled and started to go back. Uh, corruption, uh, mismanagement, abuse of power, and autocracy, and incompetence have come to define the, a large section of governance in the Arab world. Not every Arab government is like that, but many of them are. And ordinary people's lives have hit a wall. And you have terrible, terrible uh, f sense of a sentiment of vulnerability, of real fear for the future, and total helplessness and hopelessness by millions and millions of people. And the consequences is what we see, warfare, polarization, sectarian conflicts, civil wars, retreat of central governments, collapse of national authorities, mass migration, whether it's legal or illegal, millions and millions of uh, refugees, uh, and a rather bewildered international response, which still heavily focuses on militarism and doesn't um, address underlying uh, political issues, with the continued impact of the, the oldest and most destabilizing and radicalizing process in the region, which is the Arab-Israeli conflict which started about the same time as the Arab century, around the 1920s, you started to get the first Zionist Arab uh, uh, conflicts in Palestine. And it hasn't stopped, and it continues to be a radicalizing force, and foreign militarism, and ecological stress. All of these things together have converged, but in the last 15, 20 years, there's been a speeding up of the deterioration, and this is why we're in this 
a terrible situation. But does that explain the rise of ISIS? I mean, all those... Well, it explains... All of these things have to be seen as part of an integrated uh, process. You can't isolate any one thing like refugees, like civil war, like sectarian uh, violence and ethnic cleansing, like mass corruptions, like the Arab uprising, like the rise of the Muslim brothers in the last uh, 30 years, foreign intervention. All of them come together. ISIS is the most vulgar and violent form of rule that the Arab world has experienced in the last 60 or 70 or 80 years. But it is not, it's not qualitatively that different from much of the Arab rule that we've experienced. It is worse in being more vulgar, being more brutal. But the fundamental nature of rule that ISIS uh, is using is simply a, a, an extreme version of the autocracy, the brutality, the police state rule, the violence, the lack of civil rights, the lack of pluralism, the lack of tolerance that has defined much of the modern Arab world, unfortunately. Nobody would speak about this in the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. I mean, some of us were speaking about it all over the region, but nobody in the world was speaking about this because the world was happy buying oil from the Arab world or or then after 9-11, everybody was happy uh, using counterterrorism assistance from Arab countries. And nobody asked about human rights, about civil rights, about economic development, sustainability, uh, um, environmental uh, prospects, because these issues matter to people in the region, but they didn't matter much to foreign powers, whether they were Russian or American or British or Israeli or Iranian or what, whoever they were. Uh, but these these issues all uh, come together, and and ISIS is the latest and worst manifestation uh, of of these uh, trends that we've seen. But the other thing that has to be done, which nobody nobody in the Middle East, nobody in the Western world, nobody anywhere uh, on Earth has seriously tried to look at, which is how do you address and and deal with and reform and fix those underlying drivers that have brought ISIS to life. And this is where the problem gets much more complex because the complicity of Arab governments, Middle Eastern, other Middle Eastern governments, the Turks, uh, for instance, have a role to play in allowing ISIS to develop for, for the last three or four years, the Syrian uh, uh, government, uh, and the impact of the two things I mentioned before, the indirect impact of the Arab-Israeli conflict on the, the situation and the impact of Western policies, particularly American policies. And this is where the American link gets very, very complex and, and embarrassing for the American government in particular, because it was the American-British invasion of Iraq that created the environment of chaos, which then allowed criminals like Abu Musab al-Zarqawi from Al-Qaeda to go to Iraq in 2004 and start the sectarian provocations and killings against Shiites to create this tension to get the Sunnis in Iraq to work with them. And they started the Islamic State in, in Mesopotamia to begin with in Iraq in 2006, 2007. And then uh, it, it grew uh, over, uh, over the years. But it was the um, British and American invasion of Iraq uh, that provided the environment in which this, this monster could emerge. The forces that prepared the peop many people in this region to use this vehicle as an expression of their discontent or their fear and vulnerability, that was the consequence mainly of, of Arab government mismanagement, poverty, inequality, abuse of power, loss of hope, all of these things I mentioned before. So there are a lot of people who need to share responsibility for the birth of, uh, of ISIS, but they're not at all honestly addressing the real issues that have to be addressed, which is to defeat ISIS militarily, you need also to defeat the underlying drivers that keep giving it a life. Why do tens of thousands of people go to the Islamic State, or some people send, send them money? It's the discontent, the disparity, the distortions, in the Arab world primarily, ISIS is primarily an Arab problem. You have some Muslims from other places, and you have some Western people who, who go and join it, but this is fundamentally an Arab problem. It came out of the Arab world. Um, and the incubators were 
the autocracy of Arab regimes, the uh, lack of opportunity and human development for millions and millions of ordinary Arab people, and the abuse of Islamists in Arab jails who became radicalized, like Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who es essentially created ISIS in the beginning in Iraq, like Ayman al-Zawahiri, the, now the head of al-Qaeda, and, and dozens and dozens of people who were radicalized in Arab jails, in Syria, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, all over the Arab region, who many of them went to join ISIS, many didn't, they just became radical Islamists. And it was the combination of these forces that finally came together in that space that was created by the Anglo-American invasion of Iraq, that space of chaos and, and ungovernability, and that's when they said, let's create this Islamic State. So the Islamic State was a project by a very small number of militant, radical, um, extremist uh, people who were trying to find any alternative to the discontent and the lack of opportunity and the, and, the, and the humiliation that shaped the lives of probably several hundred million people in the Arab world. Yes, let me ask you then, who has the moral authority to enact all these changes? Uh, the only people who have the moral authority are the citizens of these countries. The principle of the consent of the governed is the one principle that has never been attempted in Arab countries. Popular self-determination citizen-led governance. The Tunisians are the first country that have actually done this now, and there is now a constitution that was drawn up by Tunisians and is being implemented slowly in a pluralistic, constitutional, democratic, and accountable uh, governing system. No other Arab country has done this, and it's the citizens of these countries that have the greatest moral authority to demand change and to bring about change. They've been trying to do this for 30, 40, 50 years, but the, the autocrats in the Arab world have been too powerful. The support from abroad by the East and the West was very strong for these autocratic regimes. And the uh, people themselves who tried to argue for human rights, for democracy, for sustainable development, had no voice, had no power. They were crushed by the political elites that continue to dominate the Arab world. Well, what, why was Tunisia so successful? What was it about Tunisia that could be adopted by some of the, the other countries? There were region? several factors that made the Tunisian transition successful where others didn't uh, happen. First of all, the nature of the civil society in Tunisia the nature of labor unions and other movements who could play a very powerful catalytic and mediating role among the different political groups. Second was the army in Tunisia did not play a political role, unlike, say, Egypt and other Arab countries. Third, Tunisia is a small country, relatively hom homogeneous. Fourth, there was uh, a Muslim Brotherhood leadership, the Nahda party, that was far more realistic and pragmatic than the Muslim Brothers in Egypt. Fifth, it's a country that had a relatively good secular tradition going back to the 1950s. All of these factors uh, came together and, and allowed the Tunisians to make the transition. There was a couple of touchy moments when opposition people were being killed, when terror attacks were taking place. But it was the critical role of the armed forces to stay out of politics and for the civil society to take the lead in negotiating a transition process and the Muslim brothers accepting to go along with it, even though they want a plurality of election. Those three things together are why Tunisia was able to succeed while other Arab countries were not. Rami, uh, how important is it to maintain national borders, many of which, as you know, were drawn up in Europe by Europeans 100 years ago? Uh, or would it be more realistic to let Yemen go north and south, let um, Libya go east and west, let Syria go three ways, which of course then presumes the creation of the state of Kurdistan? The, the issue of borders, again, is one that really the, the, the people of these countries are the ones that have to make those decisions ultimately. The borders uh, were created by Europeans largely. Some of them were drawn up by local people. You know, some Arab countries, by the way, were created in the same way that the Islamic State was created, which is marauding 
uh, desert warriors conquering territory and creating a state. And this happened in several instances across the Arab world. Um, the Arab-Israeli conflict had elements of, of this uh, as well. Um, the uh, issue of, uh, uh, of, of ethnicity uh, arises where you have Wahhabis, where you have um, the Islamic State, where you have people in different Arab countries saying, well, we want an Alawite state or we want a Berber state. Um, and some people have also challenged the Israelis asking for a Jewish state. So this issue of single ethnic, single religion states is a, is a challenge to the whole region because if, if you start dividing up these countries into little ethnic states or religious states, uh, it's probably going to create more problems uh, in the future. My sense, having spent my whole adult life the last 50 years or so in the Middle East, is that countries like Syria, like Iraq, uh, like Libya, like Yemen, basically are, are willing to stay as they are as single countries, but they would like more decentralized power more local autonomy, cultural rights. So people like the Amazigh, the Berbers, others would, would like to have their ability to express their identity, the Kurds, uh, for instance. But ultimately, um, none of these borders are sacred. Uh, I have no problems if, uh, so the South Sudanese already broke away from Sudan three and a half, four years ago and created their own country, which is a big mess now for other reasons. But if there is a peaceful democratic political process by which some people say, let's divide Syria into three countries, and that's what they want, and it can be done logistically, then they should have the right to do it. As a student of history, I'm also a student of counterfactual history. Let's assume that the invasion had not happened. I think it's fair to say that there would have been an Arab Spring in Iraq, but is it inconceivable that there would be an ISIS today? If, if Iraq had not been invaded and the chaos there had not happened, uh, you probably would not have had the emergence of ISIS in the way that emerged. But if you go back over the previous 25 years or so, you see these trends that I described of mass discontent, vulnerability, fear. Um, existential helplessness and hopelessness, uh, leading people to do radical and, and, and dangerous things. Uh, we saw uprisings against different Arab countries. We saw militant movements in different countries, uh, people killing Sadat, people trying to kill the Syrians, people using military force uh, in, in, in the Sinai in Egypt. So all the signs were there that uh, something very bad was going to happen. It turned out that most of this uh, pressure uh, channeled itself into the uprisings uh, in 2010, 2011. So I would say that we probably would have seen some extremist manifestation of the sense of hopelessness that people had. Why are people so desperate? Why are they so willing to do crazy things like swim to Europe or, or go to Europe and by boat or, or join ISIS or do uh, whatever they have to do to live? In the Arab world today, there are about 25 million children of primary and secondary school. 25 million. Think of what 25 million is. 25 million kids who are out of school. They're just dropped out of school or they never went to school. The, the other bad news is that of the kids in school, in primary and secondary school, all over the Arab world, about 45%, almost half of them, don't know how to read and write and don't know how to do basic numeracy. They don't have functional literacy or numeracy, and they're in school. And most of them are going to drop out. And even if they graduate, they're going to graduate with no capacity to do anything in life. And the third question, the third issue as is a consequence of these facts, 65% of new entrants to the labor market in Egypt, mostly young kids, some finished high school, most of them didn't, 65% go into the informal uh, economy. What does the informal economy mean? It means they can s clean car windows, they can sweep somebody's doorstep, they can carry sacks of potato in the market, they can just do odds that wash dishes in a restaurant, they have no health insurance, no minimum pay, no working hours, no social security, no protection of any kind. They're abused, they're exploited, they're underpaid. They work 10, 12 hours a day to make four or five dollars just to take that money home and let their family make it through uh, another day. This is a reality that defines tens of millions of people in the Arab world. And it is precisely this sense what drove the uprisings and what drives the fighting and what drives the creation of ISIS is the growing sense among tens of millions of people in the Arab world that there is no chance that they're ever going to escape this promise of lifetime poverty, 
vulnerability, helplessness, marginalization. This is the big driver. People, I mentioned earlier that they gave up, they lost the hope about 10, 15 years ago. They lost the hope, a lot of people lost the hope that their lives were ever going to improve, no matter what they did. And even if they went to school and they got out of school, they weren't going to be able to do anything other than to be poor and exploited, ill, not having access to clean water, not being able to get married. Those driving forces are what have brought us to this situation. So they would have manifested themselves somehow. I had two questions. Um, how much uh, do you think uh, Saudi Arabia and the Wahhabi religion has contributed to this? And the other one is, how much in civil si society in the Arab countries are people talking about your ideas of change? Is it you know, a few isolated people? Or is there really some movement to move in the direction you describe? Well, the second question first, I, I think the vast majority of people in the Arab world, and we know this from evidence, this isn't just me saying nice things in Manhattan, survey evidence from Gallup, from the Arab Center in Doha, from Zogby, going back 20 years, and it's all available online. Go look at the survey evidence that's available from the Arab barometer surveys. The very serious polling all across the Arab world has shown us for the last 20 years or so, which is from when we have polling, that the values of the vast majority of people in the Arab world, who are mostly Muslim, about 95% Muslim, the values are values that seek justice, uh, stability, mercy, equality, opportunity, uh, participation, accountability, democracy, if you want to call it that. The values that people have in them and want to see implemented are very similar to your values and European values and, 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 and global values. They've just never been given the opportunity to implement them in any way. And we saw what happened with the uprisings. When they were given a chance in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, they immediately ran out and 90% of the people voted and they created 95 political parties. There was a thirst for participation, for accountability, for citizen rights. Uh, only the Tunisians uh, broke through. And studies have been done by American scholars that look at Arab values versus the values of other people around the world. And they show that the, the values of Arabs and Muslims and the values of Americans are very, very close. There's a couple of areas where they diverge. Uh, woman status is one of them. The role of religion in public life is another one. Muslims in the Arab world, the majority of Arabs, want their public life to be, uh, to be influenced by religious values. And what do they mean by religious values? They mean justice, equality, etc. But they don't want religious people to rule them. They don't want to be ruled like Iran. They don't want theocracy. They want a participatory society in which uh, the, the, the fundamental Muslim, which are the Abrahamic values, are manifested in society. So there's no problem with those values. The problem is that people just have never been given a chance to implement them. And we saw what happened when they were given the chance now. They tried seriously. And people talk about this all the time. But uh, one day they will be able to implement it, we hope, in other countries. The Saudi Wahhabi question is an is a important issue which people talk about all the time in the region. But it's not talked about too much in public because most people want to get contracts from the Saudis or jobs from the Saudis or, or, they, infl or they want to sell them something. Or The Saudis have a lot of money. They also have a lot of moral force, being the guardians of, of, of Sunni Islam, and uh, the holy places of Islam. I mean, they and, and Azhar and Egypt are the two centers of serious religious uh, legitimacy or moral leadership or whatever we want to call it. But Wahhabi influence has been a problem, clearly, for many years in funding and, and promoting a, a, hard for, a harsh form of Islam. I don't think the Saudis would, would willingly uh, promote things like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. I'm sure they wouldn't. Uh, anybody who knows the Saudis and the leadership, even if they might criticize them for promoting too much fundamentalist, hard Islam uh, of the Wahhabi variety, um, uh, would not accuse the Saudis of deliberately uh, promoting the kind of criminal activity that ISIS uh, does. But ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others are a... Uh, a function of a trend in society uh, that has partly been 
promoted or pushed by the kind of Wahhabi uh, uh, pr teachings in schools and mosques all over. They've been funding these all over the region in Pakistan and all over the Islamic world for 40, 50 years. Uh, so there, I would say there's an indirect uh, a problem of the relationship of Wahhabi uh, dissemination uh, with uh, the the tough Islamic response. Remember, the religion is the only thing that Muslims have in the Arab world to respond to their discontent. It's the same as black people in the United States in the 1950s. They had nowhere else to go but the churches. They couldn't go to the law, they couldn't go to elections, they couldn't go to the press, they couldn't go to civil society, they had no rights. They could only go to the churches, and that's where the civil rights movement was incubated, mobilized, organized, and implemented. And they were lucky to have good leaders in the civil rights movement. And the system in the United States was a system that responded. When people challenged uh, black segregation in the courts, they, they won cases, and finally the national leadership responded. In the Arab world, we don't have that process. Uh, and only the only breakthrough we had was when hundreds of millions of well, not hundreds of millions, but tens of millions of people went out onto the streets in peaceful demonstrations five years ago to start the process of change, which only c completed itself in Tunisia. But it's important to remember that you know Egypt, Yemen, uh, Tunisia, and Libya, all four started very serial, very serious constitutional transitions with incredibly uh, vibrant debates about really important issues. Um, but only the Tunisians broke through. But if you go back and look what happened in 2011, 2012, there was massive uh, participation in many Arab countries seeking political reform and change. I want to thank you so much for answering so many of the questions. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.